If I can have your attention, please. Okay, thanks. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Arthur Perlstein, and I'm a professor of law here and director of the Werner Institute. Um, and uh, it is my great pleasure and honor today to introduce uh, today's uh, lecturer uh, for the Topol Lecture. Um, and uh, by way of doing that, I just want to tell you how it came about that uh, Cynthia Ermer was uh, invited and uh, accepted and bestowed upon this the great honor of coming. Um, when I was, I'm from Washington, D.C., or actually Northern Virginia originally, and when I was back home over the holidays, uh, having my holiday and actually also working on the uh, GOAL program, which is a, a new uh, master's degree program that the law school has, um, I got an email uh, from a name that I didn't recognize, Cynthia Ermer, um, saying, you don't know me, but my name is Cynthia Ermer, and I am a graduate of the Creighton Law School. Um, and I was just browsing on the website, which I haven't seen in quite some long time, and I noticed that the law school has created um, an institute for conflict resolution called the Werner Institute. And she said, I think this is an absolutely wonderful thing because after I graduated from Creighton's Law School and practiced law for some time in the D.C. area, I went on to get my Ph.D. at uh, George Mason uh, Institute for Conflict Analysis and Resolution, which is one of the leading, if not the leading, uh, programs in conflict resolution in the world. They're the first university to have a PhD in, uh, in our field of conflict resolution. Um, but not only that, she uh, mentioned what she does and also her title uh, as the senior uh, conflict resolution specialist at the United States Department of State. Um, I uh, know that you can read more about her in the flyers that you have and that you're going to hear more about her work uh, from her. But um, I responded to her email uh, in which she said she doesn't get to Omaha very often, but when she next was in town, she would look us up and try to meet the folks at the Winter Institute. And I immediately responded and said, um, uh, I'm in town, in your town. Um, and um, can I take you to lunch uh, tomorrow? Um, and to make a long story short, uh, she said yes. We got together, had a, a terrific lunch. Uh, I realized what an absolute uh, gem that we had, not only in an alum, uh, but also a person that so deeply understands the fields of law and conflict uh, analysis and resolution and where it all comes together, and someone who uh, has uh, just great insight that, to share with, with all of you. Um, one of the great things about being at Creighton has been a chance to meet uh, so many of the very accomplished uh, alumni of the institution. And I think that you will find that uh, Cynthia is uh, really uh, doing this institution proud. So uh, without any further ado, it's my, uh, my great honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Cynthia Ermer. Wow, thank you very, very, very much. It's so nice and quite an honor to be back here. And I'll tell you that it feels much better to be standing <laughs> right here than sitting up in that seat back there. But it's a real pleasure to be here to talk to you. Thank you. And um, I hope the magic movie maker can turn on my PowerPoint, because I don't have a clue about how to do it. Is that on here? OK. So we do have a PowerPoint, but we can make this show fly whether it comes up or not. Um, as Arthur told you, I'm currently working at the United States Department of State in an office that's called the Coordinator for Stabilization and Reconstruction. The office is actually going to be changed because of the work that Secretary of State Clinton, oh, that reminds me to say to you, everything you are about to hear from these lips is the opinion and the thought of Cynthia G. Ermer. It is not the position necessarily of the United States government. Secretary Clinton 
issued something called the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review earlier this year. And it is going to take the office that I'm a part of and restructure it so that we will become a very much more important office inside of an undersecretary um, with a little more legitimacy across other bureaus that we need to be able to influence to encourage them to think more about conflict, how we prevent conflict, and how we engage actively from a different perspective when we do, in fact, engage conflict. OK, it's a little light. Can we change that? Oh, it is? OK. Oh, thank you. So um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is a tool that I was specifically hired to create. The office was charged with the responsibility of coming up with a tool that could be shared across all of the agencies in the United States government, including the Department of Defense. So I'm quite glad to see a lot of folks from DOD here today. I work really closely with lots of people from the Marine Corps, from the Army and the Air Force, and also even the Coast Guard. Um, let's see who I left out. You let me know if I left anybody out. But I, What's that? Navy. Thank you. Lots of folks from the Navy, Commander Camacho. Um, and they come to and participate in these analytical efforts that we do. So the question was, what is this tool? It's called the Interagency Conflict Analysis, uh, Conflict Assessment Framework. What I decided when they asked me to come and create a tool that could be used across the United States government for understanding conflict so that when we began to plan our interventions into an, a foreign country that would be development assistance dollars or military activity of any kind, whether it's going in to do, uh, what are they called, where you go in and you inoculate animals against disease or whether you go in and you help uh, prevent rivers from flooding schools, or whether it's the State Department and its diplomats who are there every day taking people to lunch, using good offices, which is a very important part of alternative dispute resolution, and other things that the State Department does, including writing cable upon cable, as you all know now from WikiLeaks, upon cable about what's going on in that country. This is the job of many people that we've got placed around the world, and what they need to do is see the world that they're working in and report back. So uh, let me move right on. So this is the tool. I'm sorry, I get very excited about this, and I can talk about any one part of it for just about a semester. Are you game? So, uh, but we're going to stick to the slides. This is the Interagency Conflict Assessment Framework. I'm going to call it ICAF because that's what I've been calling it for about three years now. So when I say ICAF, I'm referring to the tool. When, we, when I say ICAF application, I'm talking about how we apply this process using this systematic framework to look at a conflict. We, what I decided when, we, when they asked me to create this was, if they're asking me to do something across government agencies, where we come to have a shared understanding of what we see, I thought, let us then create it with people from across all of these agencies, instead of it being the Department of State telling Department of Agriculture, this is how you're going to do it. So we had uh, Department of Defense, um, DASD Davidson, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense Davidson. She wasn't Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense at the time, but she is now. She was on my team. We had. Uh, several other folks from Department of Defense and Department of State and USAID who sat down because we have studied conflict and we said, let us make a framework. And we made a framework. And then we took it back to an interagency team and we said, let us write a book. No, that's obviously not it. Oh, this, sorry. You told me about this. Uh oh. Next. Now I don't know what to do. I'm sorry. I screwed up. No? Hit what? OK, now I just do this. Ah, thank you. Um, we created this tool by locking ourselves in a room up in Carlisle, Pennsylvania's uh, War College. And we didn't let ourselves out of the room until we had come to an agreement on what we needed to know if we were going to look at a conflict, understand its deep roots, 
so that we could understand the components of conflict and how they interacted with each other so that by the time we were done thinking about what we were seeing, frame the environment is how my uh, army colleagues call it in their new design doctrine, we want to be able to frame the environment, we got an agreement and then we came back and we wrote about it. If you apply the conflict assessment framework, the ICAF, we say, in the way that we say you should apply it, this is the output that you get. You get a shared and crucial understanding. So it isn't just me saying, this is what happened, and you, I need to persuade you, like I did in my trial lawyer days, where I tried to persuade a jury that I was right. This is a brainstorming. This freaked everybody out when I started to say, we're going to have a brainstorming. We're going to sit around in a room and we're going to say what we know. We're going to bring all of the experts from across the United States government who have this country in their portfolio, and we're going to ask questions. I'm going to go forward and back. I hope that doesn't bother anybody. We're going to ask questions about who are the identity groups? Who are the salient groups who self-identify as women, for example, from the North, for example, children, one ethnic group, another ethnic group. We describe who these people are, but we do it from the knowledge of the people in the United States government who are making policy every day about these countries, and they come up with this information. Somebody says, well, it's this. Somebody else can say, are you sure? I don't remember that. I don't think they're important. And we have a discussion until we get a consensus. And then we get all of these other components societal patterns. How did the different identity groups interact with each other? What are their behaviors? What are their attitudes? This tells us what's going on between these various identity groups. Then what we can see are the institutions, the courts, the schools, also informal institutions, the family, tribal rules and tribal structures, formal and informal institutions that reinforce these societal patterns. In Sri Lanka, for example, what we found was that the Tamils were excluded by the Sinhalese from almost everything that had a government face on it and that had a prominent aspect in society. This was what we saw, exclusion of the Tamils by the Sinhalese. What we also saw was that the, the constitution of Sri Lanka said, you cannot work in the government unless you speak Sinhalese. Tamils don't speak Sinhalese. They don't have any way to learn Sinhalese. So instead of excluding Tamils, which everybody thought would be pretty obvious and not a good thing to do, they said, well, in order to work in the government, you need to speak our language, and did the same thing. We're able to exclude that. So we see the societal pattern, two identity groups, the societal pattern they have with each other, exclusion, anger, hatred, going back and forth, reinforced by, society, by these institutions. We look at key actors. What we mean by key actors are people, but also organizations who are able to mobilize some of these identity groups around these grievances or resiliences. This is one thing I like to point out, too. Is there a little, is this blue thing? No. OK, if you can see these bottom two lines down here on this assessment framework, you see the conclusions of the framework. And those conclusions are, on the far left, core grievances. And underneath that, social and institutional resilience. And the next one over is drivers of conflict. And then underneath that, mitigating factors. And then moments for increasing conflict, moments for decreasing conflict. This was the first assessment tool. I think others have built this piece in now. But the first one that, just, that said, don't just look at what's wrong. Don't just tell me how everybody is complaining and what hurts. Let's see what's already strong. Let's see what already succeeds. How do these people survive and even thrive and persist in the face of great trouble and great trauma? And if we can understand that, then perhaps we can put our assistance, put our policy, put whatever it is we're doing in, in support of that so that instead of laying down our democracy, our rule of law system, our social structures, we can find out what's already there, what's indigenously good and strong, and support that. So we look for the grievances. We look for groups who say, we are being excluded, and we 
hate the people who are excluding us, and we will go to war to make sure that they have to stop that. Yes, you want to know those things. Absolutely, you want to know those things. But we also look for people who say, intermarriage has been a part of our existence with this other group over here since any of us can remember. And when we have problems, we don't just jump into a fighting situation because we have family on the other side of that ethnic divide. So you find these overarching superordinate identities. This tool allows you to do that. So the key actors mobilize identity groups around a core grievance or a social and institutional resilience. And what had, we, this um, formula works this way. What you have on the far left, basically, is potential energy. What we know about conflict is there's a lot of poverty around the world. It's not all erupting into violence. What it takes is a catalyst, like a key, what we've called key actor, who's able to mobilize people around that sense of grievance about being poor or about being marginalized or excluded that makes a action, right, a kinetic energy. Not quite in the way that my DOD colleagues always mean kinetic, but from, from potential to kinetic, and the key actor is the catalyst. And then we look at windows of opportunity, and what this is, we'll look out a little bit onto the horizon, and we say, there are gonna be events coming up, elections, uh, weather patterns that cause drought so that people have to migrate across country boundaries, to feed their cattle on what just happens to be the corn crop of the next door country. All of these things that are, we know are coming, we call those windows of uncertainty. Human beings, another thing that we know, is human beings don't really like uncertainty very much. And when things are uncertain, it's much easier to mobilize people to conflict, but also to assistance. Think back to the tsunami that hit um, now in 2004. Was it 2004 already? Um, the, what we saw happen both in Sri Lanka and also in Indonesia. In Indonesia and Aceh people, the GAM who had been fighting the government of Indonesia for 20 years, laid down its weapons, joined with the government, went out, tried to find all those people who'd been swept out to sea, bring them back onto land, and the same thing happened in the east, on the eastern coast of Sri Lanka, where the LTTE had been fighting the government of Sri Lanka for 20 years, and they decided to try to help pull people back together. Well, the folks in Aceh took advantage of this moment, this window of uncertainty, to begin breaking down some of the barriers to having a peace conversation with the government, and they succeeded. They actually succeeded in getting a peace uh, treaty signed, and they've been enacting that ever since. In Sri Lanka, the moment the window closed, and they did not, they went right back into fighting. And in fact, what, some, some, what happened a little bit was the sides were able to arm up during this time of, uh, quote unquote, helping each other. So we want to know about windows of uncertainty. So once we go through, once we have all of this information, we are able to say, ah, we can say that as a group, as the Department of Agriculture, who has assistance here, as the, um, the COCOM, the combatant command, who has this area of responsibility, as the ambassador, as the Department of Commerce, all of whom may be working in a particular country or region, they say, okay, together, we agree that these are the key things that we're looking at and that when we start our planning now, we're going to begin planning with this agreed knowledge. So that's, that's the beginning. I'm going to tell you a little bit about where we've done this um, and a little bit about how we actually go about doing, getting all these people together, getting them to talk with each other, making sure we're getting some of the right questions into the room, and in some cases, how we use more than secondary source data. When I just bring folks from Washington, D.C., uh, who are what we call desk officers, together in a room. We call this the DC-based workshop. Clever. And we bring these folks together. Pro we try to keep the numbers between 25 and 30, because those of you who have facilitated a brainstorming session 
and want to get everybody participating know that you get much bigger than that and it's really pretty hard to do that. So we keep our numbers between 25 and 30. And we uh, find out who has this country in their portfolio. And we invite them to a day long, a whole day. They have to commit a whole day to me. I used to demand three days, but people really didn't like that. So one day is all we get. We get them together for a day. And they come and they have in their heads what they know about this country. In addition to that, my staff work for about three weeks before we come together, pulling together everything that's out there. You, and I'm sure you wouldn't be surprised, but I was a little bit surprised what you can find on the internet. Afrobarometer are out there doing surveys, asking people very personal uh, questions that get down to some of these questions about feelings, about attitudes, and about behaviors that we need to know. And Afrobarometer is a survey like Gallup, only they work mostly in Africa. There are these things around the world. We also talk to our intel community, the CIA. There's an, a group in the State Department called INR, Intelligence and Research. They, they're out there talking to people all the time, gathering data. And then there's, of course, our military colleagues, DIA, right? DIA, D -I -A, De Defense Intelligence Agency. And there's DNI also, right? De National DNI. Hmm. So, and MCIA, the Marine Corps Intelligence Agency. Fortunately, we have all this stuff written down back in the office. And we get in touch with these people. We talk with the intel community, that's what we call them, the intel community, a little bit before we bring everybody together, but we invite them to come to these meetings. And we hold it at an unclassified level. And let me tell you, that's a big challenge. People who work in the government do not like to believe that they aren't just working at a secret level. You heard our, uh, our colleague who was just telling us that people are threatened because they'll lose their secret clearance, and this will keep them from being able to perform their jobs. Everybody who works for me has to have a secret clearance too, minimum, but most of us have top secret clearances. But that doesn't mean that most of the stuff we do doesn't happen at the unclassified level. And we do these purposefully at the unclassified level so that more people can use them. The whole purpose of this framework is not to get the best, most detailed, most flawless assessment that was ever done. You can get one of those from Brookings. You can get one of those from any other think tank. Although I think they're not as good because they don't use as good of a framework. But what you can't get is you can't get it read. You can't get it experienced. And maybe you haven't run into this yet, but what I know from working in the government is that unless people experience something, forget about it. It's as if it, it isn't real. If you want somebody to include knowledge that they have, uh, conclusions that they've reached into their 400 cable writings every month, into their decisions that they have to make on a split second, into their recommendations to their boss or their assistant secretary, if you can get them to experience that analysis, then they're going to live it. Then it will become part of who they are and what they do. And so that's what we do. So I bring them all together um, in Washington, D.C., and I invited Palma to come witness one of these the other day. We we're doing on Tajikistan. And we bring everybody together, and we have people brainstorm about the theme, and then we break them down into small groups so that we have large, you know, it goes large group work, small group work, a little individual work, back to the plenary. Keeps people, so you'd be feeling better if I actually let you break into small groups and come back and move around a little bit, but we don't have time for that. So we do that, though, in this one day, and we get people to work through this process, and it's astonishing what they come up with. We also have them work at the local, the national, and the international levels. Why is that? If any of you have ever tried to think about a conflict and describe what its root causes are, just pick any conflict in your mind for a second, if you aren't able to specify the level of analysis, the conflict that you're looking at, I'm looking at a conflict between Tamils and Sinhalese in this community. OK, but then how does that help me, the United States, make you know, national level policy? Well, it may or may not. But what you also need to know is you need to know what's happening at the national level. What if we call the national level our, our level of analysis and look at conflict that's going on 
among the, between the media and between the politicians who have national level influence. And then what about the international level? There's a wonderful theory of conflict that Marie Dugan from uh, the Institute for Conflict Analysis and Resolution, she's the one who wrote it down, and any of us who gave it any thought would just immediately agree with her, I think. I certainly do. And that is that all conflicts live inside of larger conflicts. Every husband who beats his wife lives inside of a society that in some way either doesn't prosecute those things or the police hate to respond to those kinds of things. So, and that within a larger society that says, whatever, I haven't thought that through. But whatever that larger one is, it also supports those lower ones. They're not causal, but they are supporting. So when we went to the Philippines, we had a DC-based ICAF. And then what we did was we got, all, during this analysis, we had all of these policymakers. Every time we'd say, OK, so you've said these are the identity groups. How are they behaving with each other? Well, they hate each other. OK, good. Give me some examples. What, what do they do that shows you that they hate each other? Well, I don't know. I can't really say what they do. I just know that they hate each other. So on a big piece of paper, we write, what do they do? What do they do that shows us that we hate each other? We don't know. And we get a long, long list of what we don't knows. Now, a lot of my colleagues over at the uh, Agency for International Development, USAID, say, what good is it talking to policymakers? And what I say is, they're the ones who get to say how the money is spent. They're the ones who say, OK, you can do education here. OK, we're not going to that country at all. So if you don't get them looking at this and admitting that they don't know things when they're making policy on something, how are you going to change anything? All, everyone who talks about theories of change agree that the first step is acknowledge that something isn't working right here, right now. When you get a what we don't know and you get 16 pages of what we don't knows, that's what you got, a, pl a place to start. So we take those and we work up questions that we develop which we'll take in country with us and interview people to get answers for so we can do a better analysis with the people in the embassy. And how do we do this analysis? Um, in Mindanao, we had a special challenge because of the security um, in Mindanao. My, the regional security officer and the diplomatic security people wouldn't let us go walking on the street. When I was in Liberia, in Monrovia, we just walked out on the streets. And we'd walk up to somebody and say, well, hi, what's good with your life? What's hard with your life? Or we would go to a school, and there'd be 10 10th graders who were sitting there, and we'd say, let's have a chat. And then we'd see some kids who weren't in school standing on the corner over here, and we'd go talk to them. And we actually set this up before we go. We say, who are the relevant groups? Who must we talk to? And how do we get a, a nice uh, cut through on society so that we make sure we're talking to men and women and old and young and factory owners and factory workers and this ethnic group and this ethnic group and religious leaders and religious followers. In Mindanao, we had to do focus group meetings. And that meant that the uh, embassy had to go out and collect everybody that we were going to get to talk to and bring them to us in a hotel where we had to sit. Uh, and, and we did the focus group meetings in that way. We still talked to 435, is that right? 325 people. In, in Mindanao, even though we had to do it this way. And somebody said, aren't you going to get a really bad sample? Because the only people you're going to get coming to talk to you are people you already know. And we said, yes, we've thought about that. And so what we did was we asked that everybody that we invited to come talk to us bring two friends, two people who were not like them, who were not receiving any assistance that they were receiving, and who didn't know the United States government in the way that they knew them. And we got pretty good, we had a pretty good uh, representation of people with the limitations. We have to always acknowledge what our limits are and our limitations of the way we gather the data. We did it for four days. I had four teams going out. Those are the various places we went, the dots. But the people didn't just come from the, where the dot is. They came from all around it. So the communist insurgency in Mindanao is up in the, the right-hand side, kind of between that yellow and red dot. So some of the people who were affected by that were caught in the yellow dot location and some in the red. The um, uh, Moro Islamic Liberation Front, who is the one that's currently negotiating with the government of the Philippines, was down in what they called the ARM, um, autonomous 
whatever that other second A stands for. Oh, Autonomous Region of Muslim Mindanao. That's what it is, so it's A-R-M-M, down in there. But they came up to that yellow dot. So we had representation from all around the island of Mindanao when we did this. We then do a two-day workshop. I get them for two days instead of just one day, which is really much better. And so we've got a bunch of people who've got really good stuff inside their head. Now what are you going to do? Well, we sit them down and we use individual and small group and large group and small group work to get all this good stuff out of their heads using this framework that we've got. And then we do the analysis just like we did back in Washington, DC, only it's much deeper because it's based on primary source, not just secondary source data. When we do this, we come up with some conclusions. Huh. My, okay. Oh, beep. And, hmm, okay. So, so the conclusions of core grievance and social and institutional resilience. You think it'd be hard to come up with the institutional and social resilience. It is. It's really hard. Nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to say what's good. But this is part of what we're perfecting and what we're doing is asking people in uh, in ways that elicit this information. People actually, once you get people starting to talk about it, they don't want to stop. But you got to find a way to ask. You got to find a way to make it sound like it's really important because it actually is really important. These are just some examples. This is fire that burns, so I like this slide. We have a formulas, we call them, for coming up with the drivers and the mitigating factors. And we're trying to improve on that second one. You know, it's the kind of the farmer thing. It's not just the flip side. Somebody said, well, let's do resilience by pouring water on the fire. I'm like, no, 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 no. Some of the mitigating factors will be pouring water on the fire. But some of those mitigating factors are just going to be, we've got a good family life here. And I am a model for my children. This is what an entrepreneur told me in Mindanao. They said, I don't need somebody to give me a job. And what I tell my kids is, when you get out of school, don't wait for somebody else to give you a job. Make jobs. Make jobs for other people. And look at me. This is what I do. So there are a lot of these things out there. What we have learned, what we started doing, remembering I told you about this nested, nesting these things. We have started nesting our conclusions of drivers and mitigating factors for a reason. What we see, when we're able to pull them together, we look at something at the local level, we look at something at the national level, and then we look at something at the international level, and we say, do we see behaviors that are mirrored or reflected here at the different levels? There's nothing magic in this. It's just something we're experimenting with, really. But we're finding it very, very useful. Is this the one from Mindanao? No. This is the one from Liberia. It was in Liberia last March. Um, but the one from Mindanao was really good because what we saw was that at the local level, there's what we, the United States, would call corruption, right? People were buying, buying votes. I go out and, and, and somebody will give me money to vote for them. They're basically vying for influence, right? They're trying to get influence over the person who's running against them. And how do they do it? They try to influence you, so they pay you money to influence your voting behavior. At the international level, guess what we saw? Some, the folks who were working with us from there, uh, there's an organization called Joint Special Operations Task Force Philippines, just sort of P. This is one thing the Department of Defense does really well, is they learn how to pronounce acronyms. And I like this. So this is called Jasoda P. And they were working down there in Mindanao and had been for several years, and they were doing a, a great job. They were doing a great job. And what had they gone there to do? They had been ordered down there by the Pacific Command, which is the combatant command that is responsible for many, the whole region of uh, what we'd call Southeast Asia, but also South Asia. And they had sent Jasot of P, or they created Jasot of P by sending people down there to buy for influence. They were there to say to the local people who were being approached by Abu Sayyaf and J.I. and Al Qaeda to become radicalized and terror, become terrorizing of the Mindanao, these radicalized groups were approaching them to saying, 
Oh, you need water? Oh, you need a farm? Oh, you need food? Okay, we can do that. So Jasot of P was finding out who were the higher up people and going and saying, you need water? You need food? We can, we can help you. But you know what? Don't, don't depend on those guys. It's better if you depend on us, if you let us work with you. And in truth, I agree with what Jasot of P was the message they were trying to get across is that, yeah, it's better. It's better not to, to terrorize the rest of the people who live on this island. But what did we see? We saw this same pattern, same behavior reflected that was going on at the local level as the international level. There was not causal. We do not say that there's anything causal here. We do say, because the theory of nested conflict is, if you got conflict going on at a local level, and you fix it. So USAID goes in with bunches of money, and they teach people how not to buy votes. But you don't change the patterns, the behavior at the international level. It's very likely that what's going on at the local level is going to come back. So just be aware of that. So the, the question becomes not should just sort of P go home, but what are the kinds of things that could they do what are the behaviors could they model, could they promote, that we'd like to see going on at the local level? That's one option. That's not the answer. We don't give answers with this. This is not an answer thing, actually. This is only a, an analysis thing. This is only something that says, what do we see? This is what we see. What's at the root of this conflict? Here's what we believe are at the things that are at the roots of this conflict. Planning is next. Intervention is next. That's very important to remember. So we do the same thing with mitigating factors. Partly to remember that there are things that we can do at an international level where we are acting daily. And this is, this is a challenge for the United States of America. We went to Mindanao because the ambassador said to me, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, who has been fighting with us for 25 years now, not us, been fighting with the um, Philippines government for 25 years now, is in negotiations with the government of the Philippines. We, the United States of America, do not want to be seen to be stepping in and influencing this in any way. We want to respect the rights of the Philippine government and the Moral Islamic Liberation Front. The reason I keep saying that whole thing is because the acronym is M-I-L-F. And what I didn't know, but people <laughs> under 35 know, is that that's also something else. So, the, uh, and he said to me, what can we do? And I said, well, I don't know what you can do. But I can tell you this, that as the United States of America, you are the 800-pound gorilla in the room. You are there, whether you want to be active or not. And if you say no to somebody, if you ignore somebody, if you say yes to somebody, it matters. And there isn't really anything you can do to not be there. So the best thing to do is to be intentionally there, doing whatever it is you feel makes the most sense. And that one of the ways that you can help yourself decide what makes the most sense is to do this analysis. And that's why we were there in the first place. OK, this is a little bit of nifty stuff. Um, this is just another picture of the same thing that you've been looking at. I'm actually going to wrap up on time, Palma. Good for me, huh? Um, this is a graphic portrayal of the ICAF showing you the analysis part, task one, diagnosis. That's what I've been talking about this whole time. 42 minutes. Analysis, diagnosis. What's wrong? You have a heart condition. What's wrong? The root causes of this conflict are X, Y, Z, and we all agree. We didn't have to convince each other. We arrived at a consensus through this conversation. So what are you going to do with that? One of the things that we do do with this is we say, what are the current programs in this country or this region? USAID, who are you spending money on right now? How much are you spending? What are you trying to do? Who are the people you're trying to affect? And how well are you doing? And then, and not just USAID, by the way, but also the UK's assistance uh, uh, agency, which is called DFID. And the EU are often there. And the country itself is not 
doing nothing. You can count on it not doing nothing. The UN is also there. So let, if we could, and we haven't actually had the opportunity to do this perfectly, Sri Lanka is where we've done our best, but you would be surprised about how people don't know where their money is going. Nobody knows. And, but we have them list all these programs and how much money and how much effect, and then we say, ah, remember those lists of drivers and mitigating factors? Let's just match those up. That's the mapping and gapping part. Let us just map the things we're doing against the drivers and mitigating factors and say, do we have any gaps? Are there drivers that are not being addressed? Are there mitigating factors that aren't being supported? And if so, let's say what they are. And then we stop. We put a period on it, and we turn it around and we say to the planners who've been on our teams, OK, take it away. Lead this group now in planning how we, as a whole of government, the United States government, and I'm, I'm reaching out to also to my um, colleagues in the EU and um, also Canada and the uh, um, Scandinavian countries who would like to be involved in doing this. We haven't done that yet, but I'm hoping we'll do that soon. And say, how can we spend our money better together, costing all of us less, doing a lot less overlap, leaving a lot fewer gaps, and making sure that when we resolve a conflict, it has some durability. Not that we can't make sure, but we can do our best. And uh, oh, I'll just show you this picture, and then I'll stop. One of the other things that we started working into this is systems thinking. I don't know how many of you have given that any thought, but it's a fabulous way to start thinking about the world. Um, instead of thinking of cause and effect only, sometimes if you think the effect may actually be the cause, right? if you get a feedback loop. If you get a feedback loop and you start by affecting what you think was the cause when it's actually the effect, what you may find is that you're making it worse. And what do we call those? Wicked problems, right? That's what we've been facing in Afghanistan and Iraq, are these wicked problems. Every problem we solve, produce, the solution produces 10 new problems. How to get around that? I don't know. But one of the things we're trying is the systems thinking. Think of things as being so interconnected and that the social system of a country is actually an organic thing that persists. It has itself resilience. And that if you put resources, money, or people, or time, or even thinking sometimes, the system will co-opt that and strengthen itself. This is what we see. It strengthens itself. Is there anything to do about that? What systems theorists tell us is the only way you can change a system is by, when I increase the system, by, by linking different parts of the system to itself. So what we did in Mindanao, especially, was try to find places where the system was already changing. Leaders who were already seeking to do the benefit for a larger group than just their own identity group and see how many of those pieces of the system you can link together and see whether you can cause the system to become healthier on its own terms. A lot riskier for those of us who are control freaks because you don't have any control over it, but a little more certain that the system may in fact get healthy and that the conflict you were worried about may in fact turn into something less abusive and more creative. Thank you. Did this come back up? Anybody has questions? I know it's kind of all over the map, and so feel free to ask a question from out of the blue, too. If I can't handle it, I'll say something that, you know, passes for an answer. But uh, any questions at all? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, I guess you have to wait for this mic. This is kind of like being on Donahue, I said a while ago, and then I thought, oh my god, that shows my age. <sighs> well, first, thank you so much. It was so instructive. and resonated with a lot of what um, I've read and thought and um, the question is more kind of a, of a comment. Robert McNamara wrote several books about going back to Vietnam many years later and getting the uh, war um, leaders from both countries together and, and politicians to, to find out what they didn't know about each other and the assumptions that they were making and all the mistakes they made when they were in Vietnam. And so I, I'm just 
curious if you've used books like that or other kinds of um, examples in the past of how things didn't work well in terms of analysis of international conflicts and why this kind of conflict assessment is so critical. Thank you, yes. Um, we, I spent the first 12 months of my new job doing things like that. Walking, because trust me, ambassadors and regional bureau chiefs and at the State Department are not really interested in a new approach. They do what they do, they've been doing it for a long time, they do the best they can, it works for them. So I have to find places where change is already happening and fortunately there are a few of them. And oh, I forgot to say, this has been um, approved by assistant secretary level people across the United States government as the interagency conflict assessment framework. And we've used it, I think you're getting a handout or have a handout, but we've used it about uh, 24 different times on about 20 different countries and I've got a couple of more uh, requests coming in. So, and it just got approved in July of 2008, so I feel uh, pretty happy with that. Thank you. How about anybody way back there, back in the student seats? Yes, ma'am. I mean, absolutely no disrespect, but I look at your list and I don't see that it's been used here in the United States, and I was oh, wondering. I thought you meant in Creighton. If, <laughs> if perhaps you had tried to use it in the United States, and particularly with our government that's notorious for not talking to one another. Well said, and trust me, I take no disrespect. That's the same thing I say every day. Um, well, first you have to remember that I work for the State Department, and our focus is outward, yeah? So we're looking internationally. Um, and at the same time, um, we involve domestic agencies in our efforts, Department of Agriculture, Department of Commerce, Department of Homeland Security, uh, Health and Human Services. So they are now all familiar with and participate in these uh, efforts when we do them. Have we done it on the United States government itself? No, we haven't. Um, but we keep, ask, you know, keep offering it as something that might be useful. Did I see another hand? No? You don't have to ask questions, but if you have any, I'm happy to answer them. I, yes, sir. Following up on, on uh, her question. Oh. Mm. Yeah, just following up on her question, I had the same thought uh, that we have uh, so many problems in America that um, yes, we do. in many ways are similar to the problems that you're probably dealing yes. with. And I, I, it, I, I'm not sure, but it seems like the Department of State sometimes takes a very a political role, right? It sort of meets people on their own turf, uh, as you've been describing. And I wonder if we perhaps do that less here when we're trying to solve a problem here in America, it becomes politicized, whereas the work you do perhaps doesn't? Or how do you just comment on that? Oh, that was about three questions all rolled together. <laughs> no, that's OK. I'll take them apart and answer them one by one. Um, Yes, things in this country are very politically charged. The conflicts are very politically charged. And I think this would be a great thing to do. And I, what I don't know is, do we have a body who actually could do it? You know, I don't think it's the State Department, but um, so let's all put on our thinking caps about that, who could do it? Are things politically charged um, abroad as well as here? Yeah, they are, actually. And, um, the fortunate thing for us is we can kind of go in under the radar and um, do this at a level where we don't always have the, the political powers saying do this, don't do that, and we specifically say that these analyses must be done before you consider, and this is where I get myself into trouble with a lot of people, but I insist on it, before you consider the U.S. national interests. Yeah. Because once you put the U.S. national interests on a look at anything, what have you already said? This oil, this place, is, we need to keep the oil flowing freely. Um, over here, we need to make sure these trade bout are uh, fluid. And over here, we need to make sure no drugs cross this border. So that would skew an analysis. Uh, does that mean that the United States government doesn't take its um, own national interests into consideration when this is used? No, of course not. But I say do this first as 
neutral, as free of those considerations as you can, and then you consider the US national interest. And then you consider it. And I also encourage uh, the folks that I work with and as much as I can with the National Security Council, but they haven't given me the opportunity to really encourage them about this, to rethink how we describe our national security interests. To think about human security instead of simply how do we build the fortress around our own security. Because it's, it's the, my position, Cynthia Ermer only, not the United States government, that we increase our insecurity by allowing insecure, other human beings to have insecurity, insecure futures. Yes? I'm actually a little surprised that you make that comment about the language of our national security because I, I my understanding is that one of the most significant evolutions in the national security strategy has been to um, make democratization a focal point of that strategy. It's a, it's a derivative of the democratic peace theory, yeah. that if you can enhance the spread of democracy, you're going, to, you're going to reduce human rights violations, and you're going to increase human, human security. So, so I thought that that was a trend that uh, was actually gaining momentum in the government. Is your perception that it's, it's on, the, on the retreat? No, that's not my perception. Your perception is, uh, I would say, spot on. Yes, and in fact, uh, President Obama's national security strategy says we will, promote the, we will promote the promotion of democracy. We'll continue to do that. I have some questions about that, too, because what do we mean by democracy, and is democracy always a good fit? What if instead we listen to people say what they do to govern themselves well, and is, would that not be at least a useful thing to consider? Uh, but I think the democracy approach is a good one. Um, yes, that is in the national security uh, strategy, and there are other things that seem to butt heads against that, that if you are, when you begin looking at what does our national security require us to do, it will interfere with you taking a clean look at what might be causing the, what might be at the root causes of this conflict, because what might be at the root cause of this conflict is our consumerism. I mean, it might be. And you aren't going to look at that if you begin with the uh, belief that we need to be able to protect our level of consumerism. That's all I was saying there. Okay. Good job. We finished up right at 4.30. <laughs>